For this session, I'm delighted to be joined by George Papandreou, President of the Socialist International and a former Prime Minister of Greece, whose term in office coincided with the start of the Greek sovereign debt crisis in 2009. For the next 15 minutes or so, Mr. Papandreou and I will have a conversation about the Greek crisis and the lessons learned and about the prospects for Greece over the next decade. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Papandreou, for being part of our deliberations today. Welcome. Thank you, Joanne. It's um, great to be with you. And uh, I was able to follow some of the discussions very rich in, um, in dealing with the history and also the crisis uh, that Greece has recently gone through. Fantastic. Um, may I ask, um, to start with, ask you, what were the failings that led Greece into the disaster that unfolded from 2009 onwards? How do you see those failings? I see three failings. Uh, one, of course, had to do with Greece. The other one had to do with uh, the European Union and particularly with the Eurozone. And the third was uh, a failing of global capitalism or global finance, if you like, which, of course, had started with the Lehman's brother uh, affair, the subprime uh, issue which created a global a global uh, problem. And Greece was caught up in this uh, as a weak link at, at a point where um, we actually uh, dealing with this issue could uh, could affect the global the global uh, economy. Now, if I want to talk, let's talk about the Greek uh, particularly failures. Uh, and the, the historical perspective is uh, has been discussed this morning. We've had multiple debts uh, debt crises. Uh, and there's a combination of external dependency, uh, and I would also add internal dependency. External dependency on foreign powers, which either helped or used their power to influence Greece and, and keep Greece dependent uh, on certain, uh, for their geopolitical reasons, uh, with, with quite a bit of sometimes positive, but also very detrimental uh, um, effects on Greece. But the internal dependency, I would say, has to do with the what was discussed this morning also, the uh, fact that the Greek state basically was built up on clientelistic interests, uh, groups of, 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 of uh, antagonistic uh, powers, if you like, societal groups. Uh, and this created a structure um, of dependency of the Greek people. Uh, what the clientelism in, in, in fact uh, would, would mean, uh, we can talk about it a lot, it's something that exists around in many parts of the world and in the periphery particularly, is the lack of strong institutions, democratic institutions, which will keep power in check democratically. And that is what we have seen. We have seen the arbitrary use of power, uh, people, uh, uh, parties coming into power, uh, using that power to, to distribute spoils uh, of the winner, rather than really investing in um, the public good, if you like. That happened particularly five years previous to my government. Uh, I'm not trying to be political here, but this is, the, this is how I see it, the facts. And just to give you one example of uh, how our institutions were not working, we had a statistical office that was under the influence of pol the political desires of the government. So we ended up giving false statistics to the European Union and undermining the basic trust, both in the European Union globally and in the markets. Actually, it's a scandal. It's one of the major scandals. Uh, we brought in an independent, we created an independent statistical uh, service agency, completely independent, brought in a high quali highly qualified person called Andreas Yeryu, he is still being persecuted in Greece uh, politically uh, through, through, through justice also, which shows how politicized sometimes justice is too, for what he did. Uh, all our, all our, I mean, our bailouts, uh, all our budgets since then have been based on his statistics. They have been the first time Greek statistics are completely transparent, yet he is still being persecuted. And this shows that we are still not living up to the reckoning, a national reckoning of what the crisis was about. And I believe the crisis was about 
uh, I'm not talking about one or another party, but the, certainly it was about the lack of the institutional capacity to really create a, a modern and democratic state. Of course, we've made huge leaps and bounds, and Greece has done many, many positive things over the last 200 years, and we've had uh, great epics of heroism and 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 fight for our for, for for our liberation, but our internal our internal structures need deep reforms. That brings me to the European Union. The European Union uh, felt that uh, well, first of all, there was a sense of we have to punish this these uh, lazy Greeks. Actually, we work more hours than uh, any other European Union country, uh, according to OECD. But it was also a, a, a lack of understanding that we needed deep reform rather than simply budgetary cuts. The, they put too much emphasis on austerity, uh, and that was not even the, the, the right solution for the global crisis that existed. Uh, Europe did not do what the US or China did, investing then to, uh, to really get out of the recession. <laughs> But it was really hard on Greece. And of course, it was very easy to say Greece was the problem and not the European Union structures, particularly the Eurozone structures, with the fiscal policies necessary and the way to immediately calm the markets, which did come later on. And actually, 10 years later, in dealing with the pandemic and the recession that the pandemic has created, Europe has learned. We've created a sense of a euro bond, and, and, and uh, there's, there's much more massive uh, investment. Uh, much more money going into our economies. Uh, this would have been, uh, of course, uh, been able to have really helped Greece in moving towards reforms. Finally, there was this global crisis. And of course, we had the scandal of the subprime uh, people of financial banks uh, selling off bonds, which were uh, not AAA, they were junk bonds, people buying them, uh, uh, creating, of course, a huge crisis around the world. And, and of course, we also have the huge power of finance and, and global corporations. Uh, for example, we had to raise taxes in Greece to you know, deal with our budget deficit. Uh, but at the same time, the financial system was helping people move money away or hide money, particularly the richer parts uh, of our society. And uh, this has become a global problem. Tax evasion, tax competition, tax havens. Uh, I fought at that point for measures at the European level to, to, to change this or to, to, to mitigate this uh, at the global level, such as, such as the financial transaction tax. It looks like something might happen. I see that um, the new head of the Fed in, in the US, Mrs. Yellen, just called for a global tax to deal with this exact problem. So this was a global issue. So Greece was in the center, if you like, of a not only its own, but it's also European and a global uh, crisis. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. So let's um, maybe unpick a few of the things. Um, uh, like everything we've discussed today, we have layers of complexity um, uh, that, and, and, and we can unpick these things a bit further maybe. So I think there has been a lot of agreement today among our speakers that Greece has suffered from a systemic problem um, with deep historical structural roots, this problem of clientelism and a kind of patronage, political patronage system that you talked about um, uh, with a particular focus on the period leading up to, to your government. Obviously, that doesn't absolve Greece's political parties to say that the problem is, is, is structural. Um, and, you know, we need to talk about both parties, the systemic parties, PASOK and, and New Democracy. Why was it after 1974 that neither of these parties set out to reform and eliminate this system of clientelism? Um, instead, this political patronage was used to, um, you know, boost um, the public sector. I think by 2008, one million People were employed in the public sector in Greece. That's about 22.5% of the um, of the workforce, and that's according to an OECD report. So, it was also a failing of political parties, um, your own included, um, to address that problem. So, what was the what was stopping that from happening? 
Well, I will, I will have a slightly different interpretation. We were, of course, uh, 2,000 years, 200 years, sorry, 200 years. We do have our 2,000 year history, of course, but 200 years of, of, of clientelistic policies. Uh, we've all been smitten by this idea of this, this way of, of politics. However, I would disagree that our party did not fight against it. Actually, we are the only party, and I'm, I'm not, um, uh, it may sound may, may, may overstating, but I believe we are the only party in the modern uh, history after the junta in 74 that actually had antibodies towards clientelism. Yes, we also got caught up in clientelistic policies, but we brought in reforms that were fighting against clientelism. I'll give you one simple one, meritocracy and in getting into, into the public service. Up till mid 80s, basically uh, everybody could come and say, I want, a, I want a position, I want a job in the public service, and they would get it through political means. If you had political, uh, uh, somebody who had, contacts with the, with the government or with some poli strong politician, and that's how it worked. Uh, even driver's license in the past were an issue of, you know, you have to go to the, your local politician to make sure that he gives you the, you know, a signature that you can go get your driver's license. So this is the type of clientelism was there. That's changed. We brought in constitutional changes. We brought in uh, transparency when I was in, in government. I brought in uh, transparency so that we made sure everybody knew where the money was going. Uh, everything's on the internet. No, uh, no expenditure can be made by public service services without it being on the internet. So we fought against this. We brought in a number of institutions to do this. But I will say there are strong interests that do not want this. And I'm not talking not only in political parties, but outside political parties. We have our oligarchs, if you like, or our different groups, they don't want a system which is efficient and, and which, is, which, is, which is just and which is transparent. Um, they would like to just do dealings uh, with, with government, whether it's in the banking sector, whether it's in the industrial sector, whether it's in procurement, whether it's in um, media. And I think this is one of the major problems. And one of the major problems I had, because as I fought, in the short two years I was prime minister against this, they were one of the strongest oppositions to what I was doing. Uh, and of course, if you add that to the underst understandable pain that the Greek people were going through, it was quite easy to develop uh, um, an opposition to this. However, we did go through, we did pass many, many reforms at the time, but there's much more that needs to be done, Joanne, uh, if we want to really make this country a modern, democratic, institutionally well-functioning and efficient and transparent and accountable state and governance. So governments, mm -hmm. governance, I would say, is the big issue now in, in, in um, and, I, and I'm sorry that this is a narrative that sometimes is not being, uh, not being tackled because it does go back. We have to, we have to have a reckoning about well, why, why it happened, not to blame each other, but, you know, put history to rest and say, okay, let's, make the changes. Let's fight this clientelistic way of thinking and, and move forward. And it's, and, and let me put it Thanks. this way. We're going to... in, it, it, yeah, go ahead. I will, I will con continue at another question. Yeah, we're, we're going to finish our conversation talking more about the future, but I think we should spend maybe a few minutes about those talking about those two years. So when you came into office within weeks and months, you were confronted with the magnitude of the problem that had built up of the Greek public finances and public debt. Um, so my questions about that period are twofold. Um, do you think that your government, that you acted decisively to address the problem? and what could have been done differently? So both by your government and also um, by outsiders. We've all, you've already talked a little bit uh, about that. So how quickly did you come to the view that a debt restructuring was necessary? Um, was the problem on the Greek side not acting decisively enough or what, was it the problem of the European institutions? Did they delay too long causing the crisis to escalate 
And then the solution that they proposed, as you suggested, was too extreme. You know, the austerity program that was put in place made matters worse. Yes, well, we had. So it's too. Uh, I understood. We had. We had very quickly. Uh, when when this deficit was revealed, uh, which we could do, we could not hide it, and I would not have hidden it. And the reason I would have not have hidden it is that I wanted reform, and we needed to show that this this cannot continue. We reached a deficit of fifteen point six percent. It was a huge deficit, and but we had lost the trust of the markets because of. First of all, hiding the deficit, but also giving false statistics, the previous government, to the European Union. And also that the fact that it was taking time to really figure out what the deficit was. So we were, the markets were going wild. Europe responded saying, this is a Greek problem. And of course, it's very convenient for leaders to say it's a Greek problem because they really don't have to do much. They just say, okay, you, you have to deal with it. I was saying all the time, it, yes, we have our problem, but it is also a European problem. Because if you do not support the reforms in Greece by calming the markets, we won't be able to get loans, we won't be able to invest, we, won't, we will be, uh, we will be um, people will start talking about Grexit, which they did, and that, of course, completely paralyzed the economy. So it made recovery and, and the whole um, reform much more difficult. Finally, in, in 2012, Draghi comes in and he says something very clear. He says, I see the speculation in the markets. I see the fears in the markets. I'm not going to let that happen. I myself am going to do whatever it takes, which could mean buying up bonds and so on. And we see also today that Europe is much more robust in dealing with these types of questions. What it did show is that if Europe does work together, we are stronger. Not everybody believes that. I mean, Brexiteers didn't believe that. Uh, but even Germany at the time did not want to take up risk. But I feel if we pool our risk, we'll be much stronger. Uh, finally, of course, I fought and we did have a bailout program. I didn't want to ask for money. I did not want money from the outside. I wanted access to the markets. Had Draghi been in earlier, had Trisha said that something like this earlier, possibly would have continued to do to access the markets. And we already, before we even asked for money, we had the most um, biggest cuts that any OECD country has ever done. OECD came out and said this. Greece in 2010 had the biggest budgetary cuts that any other country has done. We had more, I think it was 5% or so uh, uh, um, cutting, our, our cutting in one year. And they also said, that Greece was number one amongst OECD countries in reforms. So we did what we, we should have done. I think Europe was doing things too late and too little. And uh, I, I'm talking to, I think, had Europe listened to the United States, which had much more experience in dealing with similar problems in Latin America and Asia, the US was saying, listen, forget about this moralistic punishment, deal with the problem, you know, help Greece, do help it also do its reforms and then we'll we'll talk about you know who was right and who was wrong and, and what the responsibilities are we didn't follow and i'm not barack obama at the time and i talked to him often and he written in his recent book really pushed this in the european on the european union but there was this very narrow um, sense of okay just austerity and if we do austerity and we cut the budget markets will be fine but in the end, this was not the only way to deal with it. Greece alone could not have dealt with the problem. We had to deal with it at the European level. So too little, too late from the European side. Um, and why was that, do you think? Was that mainly because of the political situation, the political, domestic political obstacles of uh, Angela Merkel, for example, in, in, in Germany at the time? Was that the, really the problem? Yes, I believe that uh, in Germany there was um, a reticence, uh, a fear. Uh, there was a bad image that Greece had that had been created in the public public also about Greece. Um, and even though I was there as a reformer, people were saying uh, Greece cannot be trusted. So that's one of the problems. 
but Merkel had her internal problems. Uh, I understand them. However, I do believe that uh, had she been much more dynamic and decisive towards the markets at that time, at the initial stage, and said, listen, Europe is going to back Greece. Um, don't worry, you're, you're not, you're not going to lose your money. Or had she had decided, or we all decided for an immediate haircut, there were two ways of dealing with this, and economists had different views. One is that Europe takes up all of the debt of Greece, and we pay back over a longer period, which is partially what we have come up to as a solution. And the other one was, of course, the haircut, uh, which is also what we did. We had the biggest haircut under my watch uh, ever in, in, in global history, in recent global history. Had we had either the haircut initially or the backing of the European Union in the, in the beginning, beginning stages towards the markets, I believe even Europe would not have had to pay so much. And I told Angela Merkel this, I said, listen, I'm not asking for your money. I'm asking for your support in the markets. That will cost you much less because in the end, you may have to pay, which actually happened. Although in the end, I mean, these are loans, so we are paying them back um, and with interest and with oh. high interest initially. Yeah, so, so Europe, maybe this- uh, so Europe has learned run, after 10 years. After up. 10 years, Europe has learned. And I think what others have said in, in the previous uh, previous discussions, the the eurozone did not have the tools uh and the uh and the structures to deal with these types of issues uh now we're talking a little bit more about um, common fiscal policy the esm might become a european monetary fund uh we we were talking about uh, common investment or common borrowing which are already doing that now for the pandemic uh, I think that if we really want to uh, see this in the future, we have to create these structures if Europe wants to be strong, financially, economically, growth-wise, particularly now if we want to transit into a more sustainable and green economy. We do need investment. It's a time when interest rates are still low. It's, 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 we shouldn't use this, lose this opportunity. Thanks. Um, just to finish very briefly, because um, we're running into the next session, um, I wanted to ask you, are you confident uh, then about the future? Are you confident that Greece can outgrow its debt problem or will a new generation um, of Greek youth still be paying the price uh, for this crisis 20, 30 years from now? I am. I think we have great capacity, and one of the, our capacities is we have a younger generation which is highly educated. And luckily, many of them, maybe over five hundred thousand, have left Greece in the recent years, and that's one of our major problems. But they're also a hope. But to make that young generation a catalyst for change, we have to learn from this crisis ten years ago that we should have worked together as parties, much more national unity or national consensus, too easy to scapegoat, whether they externally or talking about the memoranda, but not talking about the deeper reasons why we, we reached this and talking about the clientelism or the, the, the idea of clientelism and now, and, and then the, the sort of mentality of clientelism. And my worry is that there's going to be a lot of money coming into Greece. There is a lot of money. It's the, uh, uh, rejuvenation and resilience program, uh, the next generation uh, program from the European Union. I do not want to see this money used in a narrow clientelistic way. What I would see is that this is a, a great opportunity to open up a huge debate in our society. What kind of Greece do we want? Where are we going to invest? We're going to talk about green development. Greece could be number one maybe if not in the world, certainly in Europe, in green energy, geothermal, wind, sun. We could have best biological prod products in our, in our food. We could develop wellness tourism with education and health linked to this. We have great young people in high tech and, and, and new technologies. So my criticism of this government is don't push through a program which is simply 
uh, done behind closed doors. Bring in Greek society, bring in the parties, make it an ownership and mobilize Greek society for the necessary changes. And as I said, one of the basic changes is not simply changing the uh, whole productive forces in Greece, but creating the institutions which will bring trust, participation, and efficiency, uh, transparency, accountability, deepening democracy. George Papandreou, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining us today. It was great to hear yeah, from you, you and to hear much. your thoughts.